Okay, everyone, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, uh, thanks for joining us for the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series. Uh, today's episode is called Upcycling Phosphorus for Agricultural Use. I'm Matt Schultz with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. Webinar is being recorded and this will be on YouTube and I'll talk about that in a moment. I said that this was free, but that's not really true because you have to sit through a, a brief song and dance from me about the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. Um, what we are is a member organization that serves as North America's central forum and advocate for the sustainable use, recovery, and recycling of phosphorus in the food system. Uh, I want to point out we have a great group of members, uh, two of whom are on the call today, who uh, pony up the funds so that we can do what we do. And so I would ask that your organization consider to become a member as well so that we can keep doing things like this. Uh, and there are other reasons to become a member of our organization. Um, besides this, we do annual conferences, we do a lot of social media stuff that you can participate in. Um, we orchestrate technical working groups that you can participate in and provide technical input to other groups. And then we more broadly represent the North American phosphorus sustainability community, both here and abroad, and provide a branding opportunity for organizations who want to show that they're in the vanguard of phosphorus sustainability. So I would invite you to please uh, join the Phosphorus Alliance, or at least co connect with me and find out uh, what the benefits are. Um, this, as I mentioned, this uh, webinar will be on our YouTube channel. We have 24 hours of video footage of peace sustainability discussions available there. So you can watch us from dawn to dawn. Just, uh, I'd say grab some caffeine, but actually the videos are so stimulating you won't need caffeine. You can just watch us all day. Um, and this will be up there in the next week. We'll have this webinar posted there um, for you to watch. Um, one last slide. We've launched something called the Phosphorus Sustainability Challenge. Uh, your organization is welcome to join this and we certainly encourage you to do so. What this really is is a way that we're uh, trying to raise awareness about phosphorus sustainability and also draw attention to the organizations that are doing the good work to uh, affect it. And uh, it's a platform essentially where organizations can make public commitments to reducing our collective phosphorus footprint and then receive some kudos for doing that. So please connect with me or at least go to the website peacesustainabilitychallenge.org to find out more about how you can participate in the challenge. Uh, Ostera, who's one of our, uh, uh, Molly Bidenfeld from Ostera is here today and um, they've, they're one of the first people, who've, groups have committed to the challenge. So she can talk a little bit about that later today too. Um, with that, we can get on to our webinar. Um, just by way of setting it up, um, I'd say that really any self-respecting sustainability organization nowadays uh, promotes this idea of a circular economy. And that's, of course, the notion that once we extract a commodity from nature, we like to keep it cycling through the economy rather than sending it off to a landfill or releasing it indiscriminately into the environment. Um, and the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance certainly embraces this kind of approach uh, with respect to phosphorus. We'd like to recover and uh, recover the phosphorus we use and then we use it over and over so that we can extend the resource, which of course is finite. Um, I've been going to a lot of sustainability conferences over the last several years. And one thing I've been noticing is that there are more and more fertilizer and soil amendment products that are using recycled phosphorus and being branded and sold. So I thought it would be interesting to ask some of the companies who are doing this, how this works both technologically and economically, and what some of the challenges and benefits are to upcycling phosphorus in this way. So that's the topic of today's webinar. Um, if I have one talent in life, it's putting together star panels for these webinars, and we've got one today for sure. Uh, we're lucky to have representatives online from three of the companies who uh, can explore with us some of these issues. Um, so we have uh, Molly Bidenfeld from Ostera, um, Tony Michaels, Dr. Tony Michaels from Midwestern Bioag, formerly, uh, former CEO, and uh, Marla Buchanan uh, from Green Technologies, and uh, that I'll be speaking to you today. Um, the way this is going to work is we'll, we've already had the introduction. Uh, that's supposed to be 10 minutes. It looks like I'm exactly on time. Um, we'll then have the presentation from Crystal Green. Uh, that'll be 20 minutes, roughly, with five minutes for Q&A afterwards. Uh, and then we'll have, uh, I, I, that from Crystal Green, from Astero about Crystal Green. 
then from uh, Tony, uh, representing Midwest Bio, Midwestern Bioag, talking about their Terra New products. Um, also 20 minutes, five minutes of Q&A, and then Marla Buchanan from Green Technologies talking about their Green Edge products, uh, same amount of time with Q&A. And then we'll close out. Um, so uh, again, please do submit your questions via the chat feature in Zoom, and you can submit those anytime during any presentation and we'll get to them at the end of the presentations. And if we have time at the end, we can return to any questions that are left unanswered. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Molly Bidenfeld, who's the Vice President of Crop Nutrition, uh, Market Development and Sales at Ostara. Um, she's a 20 year veteran of the agricultural industry and strong advocate for supporting farmers through innovations in fertilizer. Uh, Molly is a farm girl from Illinois, uh, which is my home, home state. Uh, they grew corn, soybeans, and raised cattle on her farm. And uh, she began her formal career with Cargill and later moved on to Mosaic, where she was in a senior, senior manager position. Um, she joined Astera in 2014, uh, leading the crop nutrition business unit in global sales and circular market development. Uh, she received a bachelor's degree in ag economics from Colorado State and later obtained her MBA from University of Minnesota, and she's uh, based in Minneapolis today. So Molly, I'm gonna pass this over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Great. let you go ahead and share yours. All right. We'll and thanks so much for joining us. And I see you. Okay, let's see. Get it in presentation mode here. Make sure. I How's that look? Yeah, that looks great. Perfect. All right, we'll speed up through these. And thanks for the introduction, Matt, um, and for all the work that you've done and are doing with the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance. We certainly appreciate it, and we're very excited to be part of the, the alliance and also the challenge. Um, and I've got a little slide on that here towards the end, but um, we certainly appreciate all the work that uh, you and the group have been doing and continue to do for us in uh, leading the way in sustainable phosphorus. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, give a brief overview here of Ostara and then our product, which is Crystal Green, which is what I'm uh, working to do, um, you know, expand globally here for, for our phosphate product. So we all know that phosphorus is essential to life, but when left mismanaged, it can cause serious environmental consequences. Um, and right now we have over 450 dead zones around the world. So uh, certainly something that we should all be paying attention to and is getting a, a bit more uh, attention in the media. Currently, the cycle is fairly linear uh, and there are multiple contributors, which include both point source and non-point source. Uh, and at the end, the result is a negative environmental impact, as Matt mentioned in his introduction. Ostara has developed a way to change this linear cycle to one that is circular, uh, and Matt mentioned the circular economy, by recovering the phosphorus and nitrogen before it actually makes its way into the local waterways by either mismanagement or the lack of management altogether. So we're really looking at creating a circular management solution. As I mentioned, the, the global focus on nutrient management is increasing. Um, <laughs> we see it every day in the news and it spans all the way from the Gulf of Mexico and the growing dead zone to the rivers in China, um, but also in areas in, the, in Europe that are focusing more heavily on nutrient management. And the, um, <clears throat> that being said, at the same time, um, and while that awareness on nutrient management is increasing, so is the need um, for crop nutrients, including fertilizer. So right now, as we look at the fertilizer, the phosphate fertilizer market, we're experiencing some near-term pressure um, due to weak demand in North America last fall and also this spring uh, in combination with the pressure on commodity markets. Um, but generally speaking, and as we look at the long-term picture, there's definitely a robust demand and a growing demand for phosphorus, all, all um, nutrients, carb nutrients, but especially phosphorus. And we believe as Ostara, there's going to be uh, strength in the phosphate market over time, and there's going to be even more need and demand for a recycled or recovered phosphorus. At Ostar, we've been reimagining resources since 2005, so we're almost 15 years into it. 
Um, over these last 14 years, we've helped to clean water and grow more food through our nutrient recovery uh, for reuse, as well as our increased crop yields from our crystal green fertilizer. Our four pillars are very simple. We create value from waste. We provide our customers with sustainable operations. We bring innovation um, in crop nutrition to the market, and we're very proud of that. And we do all of this while at the same time preserving and protecting our resources. So we have a very circular approach, and it all kind of starts with the waste and turning that into something that's going to be innovative and help uh, move society forward while at the same time protecting our resources. So the probe process is fairly simple. Um, we take nutrient rich water and comes into our reactor. We add a magnesium source uh, and we control the pH um, caustic soda within the reactor and that allows the phosphorus, the nitrogen and the magnesium to crystallize. Um, that creates a recovered struvite in a granular form, which is what we market as crystal green. Once it grows in the reactor, we get it to a desired size. Um, that could be an SGN 90, uh, 150, or 300. We then harvest it, dry it, classify it um, after we screen it, and then we bag it. Uh, and the ownership of the product is then transferred to Ostara. So these are the reactors that would be at you know, our, our sites throughout the world. Right now, of which we have 22, most of those are located in North America, and we've got a growing footprint in Europe, and then also expanding into uh, Israel, and our Tel Aviv plant will, will be started up uh, in the next 18 months, so we're, we're excited to have that expansion happening for our, for our uh, pearl installations. Our focus for the Pearl technology has primarily been in the municipal wastewater treatment space, and that's due to the regulatory pressure and elevated need to meet phosphorus limits. However, we've recently acquired a competitor, which is actually allowing us to move more easily into other markets, which include the fertilizer process, water market, animal waste, biofuels, and food and beverage processing. So our technology footprint has expanded with an acquisition, and then the markets that we serve is also expanding. So that's an overview of our technology. Um, the, the kind of the sweet spot for me and the, the part that I like to talk about most is how we've been reimagining phosphorus. Um, now that you know about our process, I'll tell you about the product. Um, our crystal green uh, phosphorus product, we've been focusing our efforts for over eight years to prove its efficacy and the benefit that it creates throughout the value chain. Uh, we know that it improves soil health, reduces nutrient loss um, and tie up of phosphorus within the soil, and at the same time also enhances yield for improved ROI to our farmer customers. So what exactly is it? Crystal Green's five units of nitrogen, 28 units of phosphorus, and 10 units of magnesium. Uh, and it has a salt index that's about 75% reduced from what you would normally find in a commodity MAPDAP or triple superphosphate. Uh, all of those components are important here as we get into more of the yield data. Throughout the last 14 years, uh, with a laser focus during the last eight, we've built our research and development program to ensure that we have a robust database to support how our product works, where it works the best, and which crops will benefit the most. Uh, we've done this using both independent and university researchers, and that's a global portfolio. So we've done trials in Canada, US, Brazil, uh, throughout the European Union, um, and then are expanding into Australia and China here this year. Our timeline um, for what this looks like, it actually goes all the way back to 2006, where we started in turf and uh, in the turf and ornamental side. Um, we initially started in that market because it was very high value uh, and we had a very small amount of product to work with. However, you fast forward uh, 13 years and we've, um, we've really focused on expansion into the agriculture market so that the um, demand for the product can match up with our growing supply. Uh, initially, we started on more of the higher value crops like potatoes. We've expanded that into broad acre. Um, as we've expanded our supply, we've been able to bring our cost structure down. So now we're 
provide an economic return and benefit to broad acre crops such as corn, uh, canola, spring wheat, winter wheat, peas and lentils. So we've got a research supported value proposition. Some of the unique selling points and, and kind of focuses that we have are the slow release of our phosphate. So we have a different release mechanism in that we're not essentially water insoluble. So we're 96% we're citrate soluble, only 4% water soluble. So what this does is allows us to have a season long release of phosphorus. It eliminates the, the risk of runoff or leaching um, in extremely sandy soils of phosphorus or phosphorus movement within the soil. Uh, it eliminates the tie up that you would normally experience of phosphorus in high and low pH soil. But it also has that low salt index that I mentioned, which um, ensures that it's got a high seed safety and can be air seeded as it would be with a canola or wheat crop very safely. Minimizes that seedling injury and allows uh, farmers to experience a higher yield with a lower seeding rate. Obviously, we're sustainably sourced and extremely proud of our um, reimagination of phosphorus resource. And we have a low heavy metal content, um, which adds to soil health and then also um, supports our growth in the European Union where they're looking at um, increasing the regulatory component around uh, heavy metals. So as we look, uh, we kind of, you know, look at the agronomic and the environmental benefits of crystal green versus um, either a phosphorus uh, fertilizer enhancer that you would find in the market. Uh, other all-in-one fertilizers or your regular commodity phosphorus such as MAPDAP, PSP. Um, and as you can see in the box on the right, we get, um, we get some pretty optimal agronomic benefits, but we also have a solid environmental benefit that helps us as we go into the market and, and carve out a niche for ourselves. Crystal green, as I mentioned, reduces phosphorus movement uh, within the soil. Now it can be um, leaching. Uh, some would say that phosphorus doesn't leach in very sandy environments, it will. Um, and also the, the negative environmental effects from surface, phosph surface runoff of phosphorus. So we've done uh, multiple studies that have looked at this and essentially what we've found is that the environmental impact of crystal green is the same as the no phosphorus control in all of the instances. So we've got a, a really strong environmental story, uh, which we think is going to be important as we go forward uh, and continue to, to see some of these issues with, um, with dead zones and, um, and um, phosphorus pollution. So when you look at the, the yield response, it's been positive across a large, uh, wide variety of crops. As I mentioned, we started with potatoes. We've moved into the, um, the broad acre crops of canola, spring wheat, peas, lentils. We've done some work on soybeans, corn with the University of Illinois. We just started that. Uh, this will be our second year of trials that will be harvested here this fall. Uh, and we continue to look for you know, opportunities to expand and, and the best use um, and way to use crystal green. The best practices of crystal green are fairly simple. Um, it's as important for us to tell farmers where they can benefit um, from the use of crystal green as well as where they can't. So we found the most success, success in either um, situations of very high or low pH soils where phosphorus is prone to tie up or in neutral soils uh, where fertilizer goes down with the seed piece uh, and that's benefited by our low salt index and the increased seed safety that we provide. Crystal green is typically used in combination with water soluble phosphorus so um, it's typically a rate of 25% of the P2O5 overall P2O5 coming from crystal green and 75% from traditional phosphorus. If that's MAP, uh, that'd be about 38% by weight of crystal green, 62% of the blend um, by uh, coming from MAP. In some applications such as turf, you can use 100% crystal green as an option. However, in most instances, you're gonna need a little bit of that water soluble phosphorus to get the, the crop started.
And as I mentioned and, and thanked Matt for in the beginning, the, the phosphorus sustainability challenge is something that, that we're very excited about and we're certainly taking part in. Uh, we've committed to recovering at least 6,000 tons of crystal green from municipal wastewater treatment plants uh, by the end of 2020 and expect to continue to increase this as we uh, increase our um, water treatment footprint and our ability to recover nitrogen and phosphorus from those, uh, from those locations. And Matt, I think that I went a bit faster than my 20 minutes, so maybe I'll um, hand it over to you and open it up for the Q&A portion. Yeah, that's fine, Molly. It was a great presentation. Uh, thanks again uh, for making it. And um, I should note, too, that you guys were one of our founding partners. Not only were you one of the first ones to join the Foster Sustainability Challenge, but you're also a founding partner, and we, we certainly thank you for that. Um, Molly, if you could stop sharing your screen, then I can kind of take over the, the presentation on my end um, and we can go to the Q&A, okay. Um, so just generally for the Q&A, if you could please avoid uh, turning on your microphone so we can keep the background noise down. Um, I'll go ahead and I've gotten some questions in over the wire here and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna copy and paste them into this, so oops, uh, if I can. Um, so I have to escape is what I have to do. Uh, so you can actually see what the questions are. Um, for some reason, it's not actually, there we go, I think. Yes, okay. So um, first question we got, Molly, for you was, how do the economics of the recovery process change when shifting from municipal wastewater uh, to livestock and manure? Um, they mentioned specifically logistics and transportation. That's a great question. Um, so essentially what we're looking at when we when we're looking at like livestock manure focus, uh, that will be probably more of a hub and spoke type of an approach. So if you were to go to a, a pearl um, recovery site right now, what you would see it would be the pearl reactor, uh, the dryer, the bagger, you kind of have a fully implemented system. Uh, what we'll likely be doing as we move into some of the smaller locations will be um, having the spokes would be a pearl reactor and those would feed into a, a hub that would have the dryer, the classifier, the bagger. Um, it, so we would centralize some of that secondary equipment and allow other multiple locations to feed into that. Okay. Um. So second question here is, um, uh, it's supposed to be a have, have there been any trials of crystal green in grassland pasture and how does it compare with traditional fertilizers and grass yield? Yeah, so we've done uh, work with alfalfa fields and we, we do that at establishment. Uh, we've actually got Washington State University working on a four year trial and we'll have those results uh, here at the end of the year. So uh, we'll have more information and kind of quantifiable data uh, then. We've just got pieces of it now, uh, but we do know that it does enhance the stand of alfalfa. Um, it has to be um, basically placed down within the root. So that's why it works best uh, with establishment versus going out on a, as a broadcast, broadcast application. It needs to be in the presence of the root zones to actually provide the to the crop. Okay, great. Um, another question for you, plenty of here. Um, can you speak a bit about how the land application of Crystal Green is viewed through the regulatory lens um, and what your challenges have been in navigating the regulations? Mm -hmm. Sure. Crystal Green um, is a registered fertilizer uh, in all 50 states in the U.S. and also in Canada. South Korea, Taiwan, um, and is recognized as an EC fertilizer um, in the European Union. So we're regulated as a fertilizer. Um, we follow all of the tonnage tax or tonnage reports and things like that that are that any fertilizer manufacturer would. You know, I think for, from our perspective, um, we're going to have a little bit of a 
an easier road in the European market as they've just uh, announced the new fertilizer regulations and that includes uh, struvite, biochar and ash. So a bit more clarity on the on the European side and what's included and what's not. And so um, it's obviously it's an evolution, but uh, as a registered fertilizer, we, we just adhere to all of the um, requirements that any other fertilizer would. Okay, I think there was kind of a follow up to that just came in here, uh, which is how does it become regulated as a fertilizer, not a biosolid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've worked with them um, with the fertilizer regulators on that. Um, and, and as well as I mean, obviously, if it were a biosolid, it'd be class A. Uh, but we've gone through an extensive process on that. Okay. Um, one it looks like one last one here. Uh, let me make sure that's correct and also try to fix this. Um, about surface runoff reduction, did these trials uh, include fields with tile drains? Uh, no, the trial, it did not. That's actually a, a next phase that we're looking at for uh, work for next spring uh, with drain tiles, because we've had a lot of questions and a lot of discussion around the impact of drain tile and fertilizer runoff. So that's on our, certainly on our list. Okay, great. Um, I lied, there's actually one more question, and then we can uh, move on to the next presentation after that. Uh, it's unclear why it needs to be used in combination with water-soluble P. Mm -hmm. That's clarification. Sure, because essentially, uh, if it's used only on its own, and it doesn't actually have the boost of phosphorus needed to get the plant started um, right at the beginning of the, of the growing uh, cycle. So that, that water soluble phosphorus allows it to have access to the phosphorus, uh, the quick release phosphorus, and then the crystal green allows for access season long, uh, throughout the growing cycles. Great, makes perfect sense. Um, thanks so much, Molly, uh, for that presentation. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next speaker, um, and that is uh, Dr. Anthony Michaels. Um, Tony, let me move on to my this for a second. Actually, why don't I just go ahead and pass the, the, um, the view over to you uh, after I read the bio here. Um, uh, Dr. Anthony Michaels is a leader in sustainability with extensive experience in both business and academia. He was most recently CEO of Midwestern BioAg, a pioneer in sustainable agriculture and soil health with a 35 year history of raising yield and farm profit, improving nutritional content of crops and creating positive environmental outcomes. Among his other executive leadership roles, he was the founding director of the Wrigley Institute for Environmental Studies at the University of Southern California. And uh, actually, Tony, you were one of the first people I spoke to when we first established the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance and gave me some great early advice that I've always uh, appreciated. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing and uh, allow you to take over the presentation from here. Okay, let me... Uh... See if I can navigate the uh, uh, look good. Yep, I see you just fine. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. It's been an honor to work with you. Uh, I actually sit on a board at ASU, and and uh, and even though I helped start an environmental institute at USC, ASU has been moving uh, uh, well beyond most other universities in this country in terms of how to make universities relevant to these these big scale challenges that society has. And so it's a it's an honor to, to, to participate in those programs that you produce. And uh, and uh, I really appreciate the success that you've had in this phosphorus area because it is so critical. And so thank you very much for uh, for allowing me to participate in this. And what I'm going to do is talk about uh, a Terranu, which is is sort of the latest innovation uh, that Midwestern Bioag has has developed uh, around the, the larger Midwestern bioag philosophy uh, for soil health and 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 uh, and crop nutrition, and uh, and I think we have a slightly it's very complementary to the other two two uh, uh, discussions presentations, uh, um, but has sort of the, the Midwestern bioag flair, and uh, and so I'll try and give you a little sense for that that structure and that feedback as part of, of laying the context for why this product uh, was designed in the way that it was and why it works uh, uh, in the way that, that, that it does. And so who is Midwestern Bioag? Mr. Midwestern Bioag is a soil fertility consulting and custom fertility uh, program company. And, and it's basically was founded by, by, by a, a man named Gary Zimmer uh, about 25 years ago. 
And, uh, and the company was founded really around a philosophy for how do you manage every element of a farm that can influence the outcome of that farm. So it's really a comprehensive management program that looks at all elements of the farm. Started with, with dairy farms where you're really looking at how do you make more nutritious feeds. But it turns out if you build a soil that adds more nutrition to a crop, it also helps the yield. And everybody gets paid for additional yield. Uh, somebody that's feeding an animal gets paid a second time for the additional nutrition in every ton. And so it started with dairy farms, still has a, a about 20, uh, 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 25% of the business, about 1,200 farms that are, are dairy farms, uh, but essentially expanded largely in row crops, corn, beans, wheat, and hay uh, uh, throughout the, the Midwest uh, and now in, in 41 states and three Canadian provinces, touching about 1.3 million acres per year uh, on about 4,500 farms. Uh, the business is mostly conventional because that's where the acres are, but this kind of intensive management program uh, basically has additional value when you're using it on organic crops. So about half of the farms and about 30% of the acres uh, are farm organic uh, on part of all of their property. And because you can get sort of high yields and at and, and comparable uh, cost to, to conventional on these kinds of high performance organic farms, but capture the organic premium, you can really make money uh, organic farming with these high performance uh, uh, biologically driven models. And so, that's kind of how MBA has developed over the last 35 years. And it's really all built on this soil health, soil fertility, balanced mineral nutrition kind of philosophy that raises yields, lowers costs, and makes farmers more money. I mean, the company sells margin to farmers. Uh, it improves the nutrient use efficiency by essentially managing all of the minerals and all of the other uh, elements of the soil uh, that influence the crop outcome. Uh, does a lot of work with things like complex rotations and cover crops and things that are even beyond how the, 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 the company sells products, but monetizes its business largely through the sale of, 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 of custom fertilizer uh, programs. Uh, it does have this benefit for increasing nutritional yield, so it has a disproportionate value in the, uh, the uh, uh, animal feed industry and, and with a big, big uh, continuing role in dairy. Uh, and almost never discussed directly is the environmental benefits that come with this. You know, if you're making sure that all your nutrients stay in your farm and leave your farm in a crop rather than washing off or running off with uh, the water or the soil, uh, you end up having a very efficient uh, nutrient balance on that farm, uh, which has the side effect then of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, building up carbon in the soil, reducing nutrient runoff. And so there's a variety of, of, of ancillary benefits, but the company's primary mission is how to make farmers more money by essentially running their farm in a more sophisticated way and using soils and soil biology and mineral balance as those tools. And Gary Zimmer has written a number of books on this. Uh, we just reissued The Biological Farmer a couple of years ago. Uh, and these are mostly written for farmers. Uh, uh, the one on the left is a more technical thing, but it really explains the whole approach. And there's no magic in this. Isn't, there's no sort of secret sauce. This is managing everything, using everybody else's secret sauce, putting all the packages together in a way that's a, a sophisticated custom kind of a program. And Gary has put that together into a series of, you know, the rules of biological farming, you test soils, anything that's structurally out of whack, you fix as, a, as, a, as an episodic soil correction. And then you make sure that all the minerals that a crop needs are available in, in the right proportions and that you're feeding soil life to help you hold and deliver those minerals to the, the crops. You use the most life-friendly versions of the fertilizers. You pay attention to things like we had just discussed uh, in Molly's presentation, where you have some things that are time delayed, some things that are, are rapidly available to when the crop needs them through the full growing season, really sort of focusing on, on, on all minerals in a, in a sophisticated biologically driven balance. Use tillage as little as possible uh, use it when you have to, stay away from it when you don't have to, but it's thoughtful tillage, really managing the soil and the air and the, the water and the structure of the soil in ways that make a lot of sense. And then feed soil life. You know, and a lot of this is, you know, if you want the soil to work for you, the biology of the soil to work for you, you've got to feed it. You've got to manage it as a conscious part of the program. And that's a lot of why Gary calls it biological farming is because you're managing the soil life. You're managing the whole biological system, crops, rotations, cover crops, 
as well as how you feed the microbes and the things that eat microbes in the soils so that you get a highly diverse working system on behalf of your, your crop. You build organic matter because you're using organic matter, not just for the sake of building organic matter. And the flip side of that is use a lot less of anything that kills stuff. And so, you know, there's no problem with using things that, that take care of pests when those pests are necessary, but use them as little as possible. And if you can find a way to manage that without putting a poison on the field, use the, the life-friendly version uh, first. And, uh, and so that's sort of part of this philosophy, biological forward kind of thing, but not being against all these other very sophisticated tools that we've developed over time that help us manage these crops. The trick with this is that it's really hard to get every farmer to do this intensive management. It's really something that is attracted to the small subset of farms that are really pushing the boundaries of innovation. Progressive farmers, the ones that want to work a lot harder to get a lot better outcome uh, than their neighbors. Uh, 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 and it's very difficult to scale that, especially into the much larger agricultural communities for broad acre crops where you have to also go through the existing retail establishments. And so the, the, the idea that emerged over the last uh, 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 four to five years was if you wanna scale the benefits of this kind of sophisticated program, you've gotta find a way to simplify it without losing a lot of the key characteristics. And Terranu was designed to basically be sort of a, a common denominator simplification of the customs programs in an area. You know, in an area for standard row crops, you most of the time end up creating the same kinds of, of deficits by things that are not managed. An MBA program comes in, makes the same kinds of recommendations to create value, fix deficits, build capacity, and those are relatively common. Every The customization goes another step further, but there's a lot of things that are common to this, and a lot of it's just secondary minerals, micronutrients, feeding soil life in very strategic kinds of ways, and Terranu was designed to do that package it up in a way that it could then be delivered to an ag retailer uh, to be used as part of their program. A typical Midwestern bioag facility has 18 bins because everything's custom. A co-op may have one or two extra bins that they can devote to, to, to all of these other characteristics. And Terranu is designed to have as much of the custom program as possible in a single package. And so the, uh, the uh, uh, I have a little sidebar coming in, Matt. I don't know if that's on just my screen or if it's on everybody's. Um, yeah, I'll, the, um, okay, uh, and so the, the, the Terranu design basically is to take manure as the carbon source to feed soil biology, run it through an anaerobic digester so that we can have a homogenized biology that, that from a manufacturing standpoint is very consistent in its characteristics, then add to it a whole variety of other minerals so you create this custom mineral balance kind of formulation and then granulate it into a form that's consistent with what the fertilizer industry uses so it can be blended with all of the other dry fertilizers uh, in, in the, 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 the traditional ag retail uh, uh, portfolio. And, um, but it is not lost on any of us that if you're going to use animal waste, you have opportunities to do closed loop upcycle types of, of programs at the same time. And when you're looking at manufacturing, you know, the typical production facility here is about 65,000 tons a year. Uh, if you're using an, a you know, dairy farm waste, it's not going to be a little dairy farm. It's going to be a big dairy farm. And, uh, and this the initial facility was built at, uh, at Fair Oaks, uh, a very large dairy, about uh, somewhere order 16, 17,000 cows uh, just south uh, east of Chicago uh, in Indiana. And, um, and with dairies, you have this issue that, you know, we've always been able to use manures, put them back on the field. But as dairies have gotten larger and more efficient, what you see is that more and more of the feed is coming from a greater distance and they rarely move the manure back. And so you have this disconnect where you're collecting a lot of feeds from further and further away. Uh, you're using animal bypro you know, byproducts, uh, the distiller's grains, other kinds of things. Things for some of the protein, those crops, again, were, were spread out across the landscape. The minerals come together, it runs through the cow, some of it leaves as milk, the rest of it comes out as manure, and then the you know, spreading of that manure on fields is obviously more concentrated than the, the local crops because it's collecting from a much greater feed shed than, uh, than starting. And so when you look at this sort of closed loop, you can see that your know, farms grow crops, some of those crops go for food, some go to feed these cows. Some of the cow 
uh, result is to make milk and, and other milk products, a little bit of meat from the, 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 the process as well. Uh, uh, but you have uh, 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 out of that process manure as a primary you know, uh, uh, end point for a lot of the nutrients there. In this particular case, we digest, we run it through an anaerobic digester and not necessarily because of the, the energy value that's important, but for this particular point, you want a very fine grained, consistent raw material for a manufacturing process. And so it comes out of the digester. The digester does make renewable energy. All the milk trucks uh, uh, from these farms are run on that, on that natural gas and some of it's sold. Uh, uh, we then separate the solids from the water that comes out of the digester, which gives you a cleaner water and some nice fiber that can be reused in agricultural context. And then that fine grained organic matter, bacterial bodies, uneaten food, partially processed uh, feed from the animal, that then is the organic matter that's blended with variety of other minerals to a formula to create these granulated products that meet industry standards. Those are then placed on fields, but they're dry and valuable enough that they can actually be then put on fields a much further distance away. So you're back to having all the nutrients spread where they need to be spread rather than the convenience of how far you can move manure dictating that you're essentially you know, spreading to regulatory limits. And so you get this opportunity to close the loop. It's not a pure close in the sense that you don't go directly back to the fields that you grew all of those crops, you know, whatever it was that fed that, uh, that uh, ethanol plant that made the distiller's grains and things like that. But it's, it's conceptually, you're putting them back on fields in proportion to what makes a field very, very uh, 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 fertile and, and having good yields and profitability. And to do this, we essentially created a very sophisticated manufacturing process. Uh, FICO, which is one of the other partners in the sustainability group, uh, uh, designed much of this uh, equipment uh, for us. And, uh, and we take these manures, the separated solids from the, the, the anaerobic digester, and then we blend them with a whole variety of other minerals. So this is, you know, the phosphorus from the cows is a primary recovery process. It's important that we get that out because they're regulated on their phosphorus uh, loading. Uh, but for us, the organic matter with the embedded minerals and nutrients that came from it and the microbes that were processing in the digester is really part of a biological stimulation enhancement of all the other minerals that we add in a formula. So you're really blending a bunch of different dry minerals and, and organic matter you're then running it through a large grand low shear agglomeration granulation process that makes a nice granulated product in industrially relevant uh, quantities. This individual plant, the sort of unit size is about 65,000 tons. They need about 15 to 20,000 cows to feed. The hub and spoke model that, that Molly addressed is, is what will eventually be required as, as you go on to more and more. But there are Large, a fair number of large animal operations already uh, that can be the basis for, for these kinds of facilities. And you end up with a granulated product that looks like and feels like the other granulated fertilizers in the dry bins in most uh, uh, fertilizer plants. And so it's got the hardness, the size, the, the density, the analysis, all, guaranteed analysis, all the things that are required to meet the fertility requirements. It meets the class A standard just because you want to, uh, not because that's part of the, the regulatory process for this, uh, but you know, you're hitting every single characteristic that you possibly can to make a no questions, uh, high benefit uh, product line. And we package these together into three sort of major classes. There's a variety of other uh, 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 things that can be done with this, uh, but, but the three sort of major classes of these uh, are the, the MicroPath, the, the Ignite, and, uh, and a calcium product. And I'll just briefly uh, describe those. MicroPack is the, 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 probably the dominant mode for packaging this mineral because micronutrients are expensive. They tend to be uh, uh, most effective when they're spread most broadly across the field, lots of little granules. And yet if you only need one or two or three pounds per acre and you're doing a, you know, a zinc granule, you're going to have one or two per square foot or maybe even your two or three per square meter uh, on the field. And so you have a, lot, a few crops that are near a granule and a lot of crops that are a long ways from one. And so by homogenizing these micronutrients, and MBA had its first you know, homogenized micronutrient product 30 years ago, uh, uh, what you get is a lot of granules, each with the right proportion of the micronutrients. But in this case, you want some sulfur, some of the secondary minerals, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium, and you want some NPK in there. And, and, and the NPK largely in this case comes from manure, though it's tuned up, because you, the whole idea of having this 
this 30% organic matter in the product is you're feeding soil life at the point of solubilization. Bacteria are the most nutrient-dense organisms on the planet. As these granules get wet, as microbes start to eat them, microbes eat them to grow, and they take up a lot of the expensive, high-value micronutrients right there in the soil. Roots pump out sugars to feed microbial food webs that then solubilize these minerals so that the root can get access to it. And so you're really looking at a micronutrient delivery product. You don't want expensive micronutrients to be solubilized and then flush out uh, with your spring rain. What you want is to deliver those to the biology of the soil as fast as possible. And you have to feed it. You feed it with this organic matter matrix uh, in the in the process. And so MicroPack is a very efficient, very cost-effective way to deliver uh, value to crops, uh, 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 enhanced, powered up, if you will, by the biology uh, that, that the manures provide. Uh, Ignite is a standalone product for, for non-grasses. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's a 6108 in, in terms of the fertility. You can use it standalone on soybeans and a lot of things. You use it in concert with a nitrogen application uh, on things like corn and wheat. And so you put this in for the balance of the mineral fertility beyond the starter fertilizers that you may also use. And then, you know, side dress or something with the, the rest of your nitrogen or blend this with some ammonium sulfate or UAN or, or something like that to get a, a, or urea or something to get a product that, that has the right overall balance. But this is all the rest of the things that a crop would need in a single package. And PNK, now blended in only a small part of the phosphorus small part of the N, small part of the K is from the manure now. You're really creating a formula where the organic matter is the biological enhancement that speeds up how the biology helps hold and deliver the nutrients, full load of, of micronutrients, decent load of the secondary minerals, really balanced mineral nutrition for most crops. And when you apply it to a corn or a wheat, you then add additional nitrogen on top of that and you get a facility simile of the MBA custom program. Uh, and then calcium is a, is, is a particular feature of a lot of the MBA programs, uh, calcium being treated as a nutrient rather than just a way to balance pH on the soil. And, uh, and there's just a lot of farms, especially ironically ones that overuse manures where, where, where you end up flushing a lot of calcium out, boron is soluble and flushes out. And, uh, and a calcium sulfur boron deficiency is, is a frequent characteristic of a lot of soils. And then there are crops like potatoes and peanuts and tobacco and others that really need a lot of calcium. And so again, this is a way to sort of deliver that calcium bump nutrition as a nutrient through the same kind of biologically enhanced uh, mechanisms. And, um, and as you know, always, you wouldn't be sitting in on these calls or, 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 or making sales if you hadn't gone out and done the science. And, and, and Midwestern Bioway is building on kind of 35 years of experience in how to do these custom programs in the design, but you still got to take a new product and put it out there in the fields and do these trials. And, and you know, there's, there's a lot of data. You just show a few of them here. You get a nice yield bump when you add these nutrients to the crop. But it isn't just the yield bump, and this gets back to that larger philosophy. If you feed soil life, is part of the delivery of nutrients. You get more nutrients, even ones you didn't add. So this is a micro pack uh, a program. You're putting in micronutrients, and yet the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium, uh, 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 the calcium are all also enhanced in their nutrient content in the crop. You're getting more of all nutrients into the crop by enhancing, in this case, the availability of micronutrients and the biological system at that point where you're, you're managing the nutrients. And so this is sort of a cor corn result. You have a similar kind of result uh, with, uh, with uh, soybeans. There's results for all kinds of other crops uh, that the company has. Uh, you, again, you don't just, you get more of the nutrients in even ones you didn't add. And in this case, you get higher uh, 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 components uh, of the more expensive parts of the of the seed to create. So higher oil content than control, higher protein content than control. What you're doing is basically giving the plant the capacity to make a more nutrient dense uh, um, um, uh, seed and, and uh, crop uh, for us to use. And so it goes beyond the yield uh, alone to that nutrient density uh, kind of a question. So just to sum up, you know, we try and think of this waste as not just waste, but it's a value add, and, and if you're going to have a value add, 
How do you use it strategically? How do you think about what the nature of the organic matter, the nature of the minerals that are bound up in the organic matter, the life that you're stimulating, how do you use it strategically? And one of our mantras, which is, I'm going to be careful, is that manure is too valuable, valuable to be treated like, I'll say crap in this case, uh, uh, and uh, this is being recorded. Uh, uh, but, um, but, you know, you're, if you're going to introduce soil life in a strategic way, you, you, you can create an enormous amount of value and you want to think about it very, very carefully. How do you feed soil life with balanced mineral nutrition and have your organic components be food, food for the microbes, target specific parts of the soil ecosystem, store your nutrients in those microbes so that they're there, they're not running off, they're not instantly solubilizing. What you're getting is, is uh, minerals held in biology Roots pump our sugars like crazy to feed that biology, create cycles around that biology that then gives on-demand nutrient supply to the crop. And so that's a, a summary of what Terranu is and, and the value that it brings, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Tony. And uh, you're always welcome to say shit on our webinars. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll go ahead and share my, my other screen here so we can get to the questions. And uh, thanks again for sharing some of that philosophy of how um, uh, you think about the product as well. Um, there were quite a few questions. Um, uh, you are all looking at my screen. I hope, can you see it, Tony? Yep. Yeah, great. Um, and again, if you could please uh, stay on mute and just submit questions by chat, uh, that would be much appreciated. Um, Let's see. Uh, we had a couple of questions <clears throat> that looked like this. Um, I'm having the same problem I had before. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> How much organic is in the fertilizer in terms of percent? How much? It's about thirty. It's about a third organic matter. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, another question that uh, came in. Oops, I just. Oh, and just to elaborate on that slightly, it's a third organic matter but it can be anywhere from sort of 25 to 50%. You know, there's sort of a manufacturing set of constraints in the product, uh, but, but there's also really this effectiveness quotient, you know, the, the bang for the buck, if you will, in terms of you want to use that organic matter to maximize how much mineral value you do. So that's really what drove the percentage. Okay, sure. <clears throat> um, another question that came in is, how does TerraNew compare price-wise with uh, synthetic fertilizer? So Terranu is, is, is slightly more expensive than the synthetic fertilizer blend you would come up with that met that same analysis. But if you were looking at full micronutrients and other kinds of loads, it's actually very, very close. Uh, uh, on a micronutrient standpoint, though, and this is partly why that is the dominant, it's probably the most cost-effective way. It's cheaper than almost every other way to deliver micronutrients to a crop, especially given the value add, the high effectiveness quotient associated with it. So in the NPK world, it's slightly more expensive. You justify it based on the additional value, the additional night nutrient use efficiencies uh, to be in the market. And we're selling to, you know, we, I mean, mid some by way, selling to people who grow corn and beans and things you don't make any money on these days. And so it has to be at that point uh, for it to work. But on the micronutrient side, this is an extremely efficient way to deliver micronutrients. And, and by doing that, what you get is, is, is you know, again, micronutrients. A lot of the micronutrients that are delivered by foliar and other kinds of mechanisms are quite expensive. And, and on a per pound of nutrient delivered to the plant basis, this is dramatically more cost effective. Uh, and actually on just a per pound of nutrient in the fertilizer, it's probably the most, yeah. the most well-priced uh, micronutrient delivery package in the industry. Oh, great. Yeah, and on that same theme of sort of the value add, oh, that, that doesn't look good. Um, um, uh, did you find that uh, uh, the recycled nutrient content in the product was a selling point when trying to sell, sell this to get ag retailers and distributors to, to sell the product? Do they feel much pressure to be sustainable? Well, it, it gets to my classic answer to almost every question. It depends. Uh, uh, the... Um, um, we found at the early stages there was romanticism about manure. A lot of farmers remember when they had manure, they had animals on their farms, so they had access to manure. They're all sure their farms were better when there was uh, access to manure and organic matter was in better shape on the farms. That romanticism does not easily apply to the way we have pushed traditional synthetic fertilizers uh, through the industry. And so 
So the romanticism about manure has not really translated into a positive selling point. The flip side is organic matter. Everybody understands that we have been slowly degrading the organic matter content and value on farmland across the United States, and their farms would be better if they could rebuild the organic matter uh, 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 in a generic sense without getting into the details of microbes and all that kind of stuff. And so in that sense, I think people really see the value. And I think probably the biggest thing is that, you know, we've been adding a lot of NPK, and more NPK hasn't been helping yields uh, and yet there are people out there that are growing 500 bushel corn. And what do they do different than their neighbors who you know, grow 170? Uh, they generally look at things like micronutrients and soil biology and soil life. And so there is this sense that, that's emerging in the industry at the ag retailer is that the farmers see the, the need for micronutrients and biology. They want it. They need it to fit into their mindset for how you have a cost-effective product. And that's why that micronutrient one is so specifically designed to fit into both their sense of what they can afford and their sense of what is really required if they want to take their farm up a notch uh, uh, in terms of, of the quality of the outcome. Uh, the sustainability outcome has been an interesting talking point. Some companies care for it at the top, but generally I think at the agronomist level who's interacted with the farmer – uh, at the individual locations on a big co-op, you're not seeing that be the driver. It comes up sometimes, but it's not it's not the driver uh, uh, as much. Yeah, great. Um, one last question before we go on to Marla. Um, what are the biggest barriers to growth for Terra Nuda that you see? Um, I think that the biggest barriers to growth are just the 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 the, the, um, the, 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 the nature of adoption in a in a tough agricultural market. You know, farms don't have extra money to spend trying stuff out. They're reticent to do it. Their banks tend not to be willing to extend operating loans uh, anywhere near as readily as they did when corn was, you know, five, six, seven dollars a bushel. And so right now you've got a real tough uh, uh, macro environment and banks sort of uh, uh, forcing on the, the agricultural uh, area. People aren't trying. So everybody needs to try stuff. That's a part of the process. I think you just have a longer adoption curve for any kind of a product. Uh, because you've got these other stresses and these real restrictions on cash when you're just not making money uh, uh, on most row crops. And so I think that's probably the biggest barrier. It's, you know, in the, the flip side is farms need to make more money. Tools like this that make more money for a farm is a really valuable uh, thing for that, that farm. That's what they need to be able to survive these kinds of downturns, but it's a very stressful time to try things that are new. Great. Thanks for those answers, uh, Tony. And uh, thanks again for your presentation. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank um, you guys very much. Yep. Sure. Uh, and now we're going to move on to our final presentation. Uh, last but not least is uh, Marla Buchanan. And um, she's from Green Technologies. Um, she's the Chief Operating Officer and General Counsel there. And she was one of the original founding partners. Um, I think, um, oh, sorry. I check here. Um, so prior to joining Green Technologies full-time, uh, she was a shareholder and lawyer at the Jacksonville law firm Rogers Towers PA. She earned her undergraduate and law degrees from University of Florida and created the Missing Link Program for Domestic Violence Victims. So uh, Marla, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and pass control of the thing over to you if you want to share your screen. And thanks yeah. for joining us. Of course, of course. Well, thank you for the introduction, Matt. And it, it's a privilege uh, to obviously be presenting today. Um, one of the things that um, you know we have focused on, and I'm going to, there we go. Um, try to be uh, quick through things is is obviously our mission statement when we formed Green Technologies uh, back in 1999 was um, basically to create products from sustainable resources. Um, and so we formed a company, uh, myself and Dr. Varshovi back in 1999. Um, Dr. Varshovi uh, earned his PhD in the soil and water science department from the University of Florida. So he was uh, well-versed in, um, you know, environment, he also has a degree in environmental engineering um, in sustainability. Um, and our focus really was uh, to be a leader in the process and, and product development for utilization of renewable resources. Um, and so we have um, put a lot of R&D focus 
into uh, developing products um, that recycle nutrients. Um, and one of our product lines is a product line called Green Edge. Um, and uh, basically, we take biosolids, uh, which are an organic byproduct of the wastewater treatment process um, that contain valuable nutrients, and we convert them into commercially viable products um, for use in a variety of markets. Um, biosolids um, are produced on a daily basis throughout the United States. It's estimated that there are 13 million dry tons of biosolids produced every year, uh, which, which results in about 520,000 tons of phosphorus. Um, phosphorus is an inherent component of biosolids, um, and its concentration in biosolids and dry biosolids um, can vary um, anywhere from two to six percent, uh, depending on um, where they're being produced um, and the, the um, feedstock of the biosolids. So if it's in a, a major industrial area, uh, the phosphorus may be a little higher, um, but uh, that, that's typically the range. Um, and traditionally, um, and the, what we're looking at right now is a slide based on Florida production of biosolids. It's estimated approximately 300,000 dry tons of biosolids are produced just in the state of Florida alone. Um, and traditionally, biosolids have either been land applied um, in a cave um, or uh, landfilled um, or marketed directly uh, as a class A fertilizer product. And so, um, I'm sorry, Marlo, we're, we're sort of losing your audio. I'm not sure if your um, oh, mic's getting out. Yeah. Okay. Um, is that better? Yeah, that's great. Okay, um, just as a quick overview, biosolids bio can be treated to different levels. Um, and traditionally, what most people are familiar with is a class B biosolid um, that is land applied in cake form. Um, and there's been a lot of publicity with regards to that. Um, and then there's what we call class A biosolids. Um, and um, those are traditionally pelletized and treated to the highest level so that they're unregulated. And our biosolid products are class A, um, exceptional quality biosolid. Uh, and we basically have um, created a patented process that allows us to go in um, and take the biosolids and improve their physical and chemical uh, value. Um, there are a lot of challenges that um, face biosolids. Um, there's regulatory challenges, so the Class B biosolids that we were just talking about um, are slowly being restricted, um, and uh, at some point we expect that there will be a ban on land application of Class B biosolids altogether. Um, obviously, there's public perception issues, um, and you know they've been linked to algae blooms, and then, of course, you know, weather and environmental concerns. But the biggest challenge um, that biosolids face is it's something that, you know, is produced on a daily basis, right? So every day when, you know, you're just, you're, you're, your community is producing biosolids and something has to be done with them. Um, so they, they either have to be land applied, they have to be converted into a fertilizer, or they have to be landfilled. There's the, the there's, um, they have to, in some way, be managed. Um, and so one of the, obviously, benefits to biosolids is they're organic-based. Um, they contain macro and micro micronutrients, but there are limitations um, from, a, from an agricultural standpoint and from a, from a commercialization standpoint. And those limitations are low nutrient content, um, and in some cases, the, the physical quality of those products. So uh, some biosolids, if they're being um, dried, can be uh, very light. So from an agricultural standpoint, when you're looking at the farmer's perspective, um, they do like the organic component, but the low nutrient value and the density of the product makes it expensive um, for them to apply physically. So. Whereas they may be able to buy uh, uh, 
nitrogen commodity and put it out uh, in, in one pass, they might have to do five passes with a biosolids to get the same nutrient content, depending on their application rates that they're um, trying to reach. So what we have done as a company, um, uh, we have uh, basically developed a process that allows us to go in before the biosolid cake is dried and add additional nutrients to that biosolid so that it's basically converted into a commercial fertilizer. So we can increase the base nitrogen, which can run inherently as low as 3% up to 6% in biosolids. We can we can increase that up to 10%. We can increase the phosphorus. We can add potassium, which is not inherently found in biosolids. Um, and we can also add other micronutrients um, in addition to the micronutrients that are inherent in the biosolids. Um, so this gives us uh, the capability um, from our patented technology to produce a homogeneous organic-based fertilizer um, whose physical qualities are increased because our process increases the density um, as well as the nutrient content and value of that product, making it a sustainable product both in the ag market and the other markets um, that we're in. So um, one of the things that our technology allows for is different release mechanisms. So again, you know, one of the challenges, and I think it's a challenge to any organic product, is that the release is typically by microbial degradation. So if you, if, if you are in a cooler months, so, or in a nor more northern climate, um, or you're lacking um, moisture or rain, uh, you won't get a breakdown of the nutrients um, that the plant might need in order to thrive. Um, with our technology, because of uh, the way that we um, add our nutrients and adhere it to the organic base, um, you get a release mechanism not only through microbial degradation, which is the part of that slow release mechanism, but you also get it through hydrolysis or watering. So when the fertilizer is applied, you'll get an initial response that you wouldn't otherwise get with just a traditional organic based fertilizer. And then you get that slow release benefit over time through microbial degradation. Um, and this is truly, uh, you know, recycling phosphorus, you know, at its highest value. Um, because it, it basically, instead of mining phosphorus uh, or buying phosphorus from a commodity as a commodity, um, basically we're just taking phosphorus that, that's naturally produced um, cyclically uh, and introducing it back into the soil through an organic base. We have a variety of different um, homogeneous products and these are just some examples. Um, our products are USDA uh, certified bio-based products um, and the nutrient, the, the organic content um, can range anywhere from 70% to 30%. Um, so it's adding carbon back into the soil. Um, so you're getting that benefit uh, as well. When we were looking at our competitors and the different markets um, that we're in, um, because biosolids are produced on a daily basis, um, you know, they have to be moved on a daily basis. Um, so it's, it's not like you can, you know, shut off the faucet and stop production. Biosolids are being produced every day. And so we have developed a diverse market, which includes agriculture, it includes lawn and landscape, um, and um, you know, basically golf courses, sports fields, um, and, and that type. We've also developed export markets as well to help us um, move product when they may not necessarily be um, in season in the in the U.S. And so that's you know obviously one of the the, the bigger challenges um, with the, the biosolid based products um, that we produce. Uh, but um, you know when we look at our competitors, we look at Melorganite, Scott's Turf Builder, Scott's Bonus S. Um, and we, from a price standpoint, can be very, very competitive, especially when it comes to Scott's um, and some of the other more traditional home lawn um, fertilizers that you might find 
in um, Home Depot or a Lowe's. And the reason for this is, of course, it's our base materials, the biosolids were able um, to, to source um, very economically. Um, and then by adding additional nutrients, we can increase that value and be very competitive in the market. Obviously, um, our Green Edge products are renewable um, in the sense that we are recycling nutrients that, again, are produced on a daily basis. Because they're organic based, they save um, on water input uh, because when you introduce them into the soil, obviously they increase the water holding capacity, um, especially in Florida of our sandy soils. Um, they also hold nutrients in the soil longer so that it makes whatever is being applied um, more efficient. Uh, and of course it adds organic matter um, and it's a very cost effective slow release fertilizer compared to some of the other traditional slow release technologies out there. Um, and again, with our market selection and development, you know, we've, we have um, had to be very diverse in the way that we've approached that um, the home lawn and garden industry has been um, an area that we have focused on um, mainly through distributors um, and then of course you know we have our agriculture markets um, that we sell to um, through basically that's a more of a southeast market for us um, our home lawn uh, and specialty uh, golf and sports fields is a, is a national and international market for us um, we go through regional distribution networks, national distribution networks, and international distributors. South America is a, is a, a, a good market for us um, because of its proximity um, from a logistics standpoint. Um, we currently sell our Green Edge product lines in both a, a retail um, through distributorships and then through direct sales as well. Um, you can find us in Ace Hardware, Home Depot.com, Amazon.com, Independent Garden Centers, um, and then obviously um, we have John Deere Landscapes, which is now Site One, um, which is the, I believe it's the largest lawn and landscape distributor in the United States currently. Um, part of uh, what we do uh, is public outreach and partnerships uh, because one of the challenges obviously to a biosolids based product is the public perception uh, and so we try not to focus on the biosolids aspect of it but more on the organic aspect as well as the sustainability aspect um, and the recycling and upcycling of phosphorus and other valuable nutrients that would otherwise be lost um, and we do that in a number of ways through partnering with environmental organizations, um, through early education um, efforts, and through community events. And we found those to be very um, successful. Uh, and so that's in a nutshell what, what we do and how we are approaching the um, phosphorus uh, sustainability um, problem and uh, welcome any questions that you might have. Great, thanks so much, Marla. It was a good presentation, and uh, we also appreciate that you're members of Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance as well. Which is well, we're, we're proud to be a member. <laughs> Great. Um, if you want to go ahead and stop sharing your screen, I can kind of take over for the Q&A here. Um, and there are a few questions that came in. Um, so again, if you could please uh, keep yourselves on mute, I'll just go ahead and post these questions on the, on the slides. Um, so the first question that came in uh, was this. What is the physical nature of your product? Meaning is it uh, pellets or is it liquid or how does it come, how does it come in the package? Yeah, so it's um, pellets. Um, so, you know, it looks like a traditional organic based fertilizer, um, except that it obviously our patented technology um, has the multi-release mechanism to it and it has a higher nutrient content um, that includes additional nutrients that you wouldn't otherwise find um, necessarily in, a, in an organic-based fertilizer, uh, biosolids fertilizer. Great, thanks. Um, another question that came in is, um, what processes are used to achieve the um, EQ, class A, class A EQ? 
So we, uh, the, the, we heat dry the biosolids, so it's a time and temperature uh, process. Um, so uh, essentially it treats it to the highest level, killing off obviously any uh, microorganisms um, and um, uh, basically meeting all EPA uh, guidelines for exceptional quality biosolids. Okay, um, and I sort of echo this question, I think it's interesting. Um, that you're exporting internationally um, with this problem where some regions of the world don't have enough pee and we tend to have areas with too much pee in a lot of places. Um, right. That work uh, isn't that expensive to ship overseas. Um, you know, it, the, the interesting thing is about the, the export market is, um, you know, for, for us, when we look at it and we think about, you know, importing products, it would be expensive. But for many, many countries, as you said, they, they don't have phosphorus. So they're importing um, most of their uh, fertilizers. And so you can still be very cost competitive, um, or at least we find we're able to be very cost competitive um, in exporting our products overseas. Um, so, you know, I, obviously there, there's always a logistics expense, but, um, but we are, we're able to be cost competitive because they're importing most of their plant nutrients to begin with. Uh, great. Thanks so much. And, and someone just noted that uh, I wasn't sharing my screen. I appreciate yeah. that heads up and sorry about that to everyone. Um, I hope you question, followed the questions uh, anyway. Um, I think that's it for questions, Marla. So thanks again for your um, presentation. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And uh, I think we can wrap up there, everyone. Um, thanks so much for joining us for this webinar. Again, this will be online uh, within the next week. I usually get, out, get it up pretty quickly. If you go to YouTube and just search for the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance, you can see our various um, uh, web channels. And this is under the Sustainable Phosphorus webinar series. Uh, again, thanks to all of our panelists for their presentations and thanks to you for showing up. And I also uh, will once again reiterate um, that, that we would love to have uh, more organizations join the Sustainable Phosphorus Alliance and the uh, Phosphorus Sustainability Challenge. So please do contact me um, and get to me through our website uh, at phosphorusalliance.org if you want more information about that. Okay, well, thank you so much to everyone and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.